Okay. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to the September 29th meeting of the Public Infrastructure Committee. My name is Tony Emerson. I represent District 4, and I have the honor of chairing the committee this year. If my colleagues would please introduce themselves. Uh, Neil Dobler, District 7. Michelle Hofer, District 9. All right, thank you. And we're joined this morning by our Public Works Director, Braxton Copley, and our City Manager, Mr. Ninestead. So, uh, first order of business is to approve the minutes from our August 29th meeting, and I would entertain a motion. So moved. I'll second. All right, it's been moved and seconded to approve the uh, August 29th minutes. All in favor say aye. 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 Okay, passes three to zero. The next item is uh, some traffic signal projects over 250. So, Mr. Copley. Thank you, and for the benefit of the public, as the CIP was passed this last year, it contained a provision that requires any individual project of over $250,000 to come back in front of this committee and the governing body for specific project approval before we put that project out to bid. We have four projects for your consideration today. These are traffic signal improvements. At the uh, first is the intersection of 10th at Washburn and Lane. Then we have 21st and Randolph. We have Independence and Topeka Boulevard, which is our oldest traffic signal, which is just about 50 years old. And then we have 21st and Chelsea. Uh, we have included project budgets, two of which were incorrect, and I provided you with uh, copies of the corrected ones yesterday, and I will gladly stand for any questions on these traffic signal improvement projects. All right, thank you, Mr. Copley. Any questions on these? All right, and you need, uh, yeah, you need us to approve. Uh, if there's no questions, then I'd entertain a motion. So moved. Second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. All in favor say aye. 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 All right, passes three to zip. Next item is a firm repair update. Correct, and um, again, the back prior to this, year's action of the CIP. It was a requirement that any expenditure of firm money be approved by this committee and by the governing body. So in a abundance of caution, we've gone ahead, even though these projects are under $250,000, we want to be forthright and upfront with you. And so we went ahead and are putting these in front of you to get your, uh, so that you're fully aware of these and to get your uh, consent to move forward on these. We have holiday climate control upgrades, as you guys are all aware. This past spring, we replaced the condenser units up on the roof of the holiday building. Um, we've had some issues in terms of operating those, and those issues are not because of the new condenser units. The issues are we have a operating system that is 2005 that is at the absolute end of its uh, life expectancy, and the technology has morphed in these intervening 20 years, and so, 62,000 is for the holiday climate control upgrades. Then we have additional work that was identified as part of our City Hall HVAC. And we've identified additional asbestos and lead. Well, we don't have a limitless budget under that $22 million that you all approved for HVAC. And so we had to identify a funding source to be able to do the remediation as well as the restoration of this work. So the estimate that we have currently is $148,000. And again, this is necessary work because we have to remediate it and we have to go back and restore it. The last item is the TPAC steps. Approximately five years ago, those steps were replaced. Apparently, there was um, uh, a either a design defect or a construction defect because those stairs are absolutely failing. And so the estimate that we have, this is a high-level estimate, we will obviously put this out for bid and fine tune it based on the actual bids is $58,000 to, my hope is, properly and finally repair the steps at TPAC. So that's our, that's our ask in terms of the um, firm expenditures, and I will defer to legal of whether or not we actually need a motion and resolution. I think this is really more of a matter of 
getting you up to speed in terms of what we're doing because we're under that $250,000 threshold established under this last CIB resolution. Um, questions, uh, go ahead, Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Braxton, just, just so I'm clear on this, th this is under the firm program that's uh, approved every year in the CIP for X amount of dollars, and then these projects come Correct. come along and we see them individually, but they're pulling out of that pot of firm money. Is that, that is correct? correct, and it's approximately two, $2.2 million, and the, this year, as you'll remember, governing body made a de determination to cash fund firms, so it's truly operating funds, not even a capital expenditure, because right. we're, not, we're not bonding those, which we've had to do in the past. Fantastic, thank you. All right, any other questions? And so I guess I guess the question you just posed, Mr. Copley, is whether or not we need a resolution here and Okay. All right. No action needed from us in. Thank you, Mr. Copley, for that. Uh, the next item it looks like is the fleet garage. So take it up again. Correct. So um, I provided the governing or council or the committee members with a memo basically outlining the issue. So the starting point is Q1 of 2025, the existing light duty garage, which is in the parking lot of the LEC, needs to be demolished to be able to construct the Polk Quincy Viaduct. So that is the clock that is currently ticking. We have looked at a myriad of sites, uh, some of which that they're listed on the, in the table on page two of my memo. Some of these were bare dirt sites. One site was the existing um, KDOT fleet garage. We were thinking outside the box. We're looking at a couple of facilities that are not even uh, fleet garages that we would have to be retrofit um, to be able to accommodate. But bottom line is this problem is not going to go away. We have been able to, when working with KDOT, we were able to get the extension until Q1 of 2025. Initially, they wanted us out end of July of 2024. Uh, we recognize that uh, it's going to be during the construction zone. There's going to be some limitations in terms of our use, but they're al at least allowing us to stay in there until Q1 of 2025. Uh, we have a couple of different options. One would be to lease a facility uh, to retrofit that facility to be able to operate. Obviously, we would be paying um, property tax, insurance. We would be um, paying for, uh, quite honestly, the profit of the individual who would be leasing the property. Uh, the other option, uh, which to me makes the most sense, which is to make the capital investment to go ahead and construct a new fleet, fleet garage on city-owned property that would not be subject to real estate taxes because uh, from my perspective, we have an ongoing need to maintain our fleet of vehicles um, through the city of Topeka. But this is absolutely a policy decision for you. The point of this is to basically frame the issue for you, lay out some options and to see if there's any direction that the, the committee wants to provide us or any questions that you have, anything that you want us to take a further look at. Thank you, Mr. Copley. Uh, questions? Uh, Deputy Mayor, go ahead. Sure, there's quite a few questions, so I'll just get it started here. What, so a new build is five and a half million. How many square feet are we looking at there? I'll defer to Jason. Do you know off the top of your head? Approximately 14,000 square feet, and that would be 16 bays would be commensurate with what we currently have. So you're, you're talking about 3.2 from the reserves and debt finance the rest of it or what? No, sir. 2.3 is what KDOT has offered for compensation. So the 2.3 million would be money that we have coming in from KDOT that obviously would go into the general fund. Our ask would be that would be repurposed to go towards the purchase and construction of this. The delta and the 5.5 honestly is, is a little on the high side, but our architect wanted to put a number out there that we were not going to exceed. There's an opportunity for value engineering. There's an opportunity to do, approach this from design build to even further engineer. But 
rough numbers, we're looking at the delta would be between the 2.3 and the 5.5. That would be 3.2. Our ask would be not to bond that. Our ask would be to tap into the cash reserves at the end of the year to get those down to a, a level that's more in accordance with the, the policy as well as to avoid then having to pay finance and interest costs on that. What about time frame? Q1 of 2025 is essentially a year away. Correct. And realistically, I would say we're looking at a year and a half to two years in terms of by the time we get design build team, get it, get moving, construction, permits, all of that. And then the question is, what do we do in the, in the intervening time? Um, I've challenged my staff to look at that. Do we have the ability to dump people into some of our facilities to basically do double duty? Do we need to look at a potential temporary site to, to get us through till we have construction? I don't have a clear answer for you, but I can tell you we've I recognized that that is an issue and, and are looking at possibilities. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Okay, I have to go through the different questions as I remember them. Um, the money that they're giving us, is that strictly a buyout? Is there any relocation cost, or is that included? No. The 2.3 is the compensation to make us whole for the acquisition of the property, including the uh, materials in there. Relocation benefits would be separate and distinct. Those would be available if, for example, we were to identify and purchase a existing property that needed to be retrofitted and to be brought up to code, there would be some potential relocation benefits that would be available. But until we I would identify that and start that process of negotiating with KDOT, I do not have those numbers. So if we say we take a piece of ground that the city owns and we decide to build on it, do we get any relocation costs? I don't believe that we would, but we will follow up with KDOT on that. Okay. Because um, I know some of the people down in the uh, Harrison Jackson area, I don't know exactly how they worked out, but some of them had to build new because there was nothing available that they could move into that would meet their needs. So, um, next question is. The equipment inside is ours and ours to move, correct? That is correct. If they're, say the lifts are still in good shape, but I didn't know about that. Okay, is it? Right, it would be, a, it would be absolutely on a piece of equipment by piece of equipment basis in terms of what is the remaining useful life? Is it possible to rehabilitate, refurbish, or does it make more sense to replace? Okay. Um, if we would go into an existing building that we have to, that is not any type of a garage, um, time-wise, is that shorter uh, construction-wise compared to a new build? Are we talking half the time? or? That, that's a great question. My initial thought would be it's going to be pretty, pretty similar. similar by the time we get, the, get it inspected have the analysis done in terms of life safety codes, electrical, plumbing. We would know that we need to install floor drains, grease traps, all of that. I mean, it's going to, I think that they're going to come out to be pretty That's even in terms of what that total period of time is. Okay, then um, this is strictly cars. It's not heavy-duty fleet at all. Correct, ma'am. We're just talking about the light duty shop. So we have three different facilities for fleet. We have the light duty shop, which is basically the police cruisers, as well as all of the vehicles that you see out in the, the parking lot. Mm -hmm. um, that's light duty. Then we have a heavy duty, which is at 201 North Topeka. And that's going to be basically our, all of our dump trucks, our motor graders, all of those heavy duty pieces of equipment. And then the third one we have is basically the very specialized fire department garage, which is basically our engines and our aerials. Okay. I know one priority is to keep it somewhat centralized so it is not driving like clear out to Forbes Field 
for every time you've got to do any kind of work on a vehicle, it's nice to have it right by the law enforcement center. So my preference is to stay close to that. But one thing I have thought about, and it comes from years ago, there was a new industrial park that I believe was, um, I know it was zoned, I believe it was platted, just east of K4 off of what goes down the center of Oakland. Golden, Sardu. Sardu. Yeah. Just on the east side of K4. I don't know if it's, have you looked over there at all? Um, the the sites that we've looked at are the ones that are identified in the are identified in the table. The my, my proposal would be to construct on existing city properties so that we don't have to bear the cost of the purchase of new real estate. That would be my preference too. But just as a backup, I don't know if the park has ever been uh, had the plumbing or the sewer lines, water lines, anything run to it. But I thought of that one since it was industrial. So it's an outside thought. Um, I'll let Tony go ahead. I'm going to sure. come up with. Sure. Um, I know we met last week and talked about this. Um, I, I, I guess I'm still a little bit on the fence. Is this, is this a business the city should be in? You know, what's the business? And I, and I know... Um, this Ms. Yorig uh, did some analysis, and is that something you could share with us, just to show what the what the benefit of us, us doing this is? Um, you know, obviously we have private providers in in town here, uh, and I, t I totally understand uh, wanting to do this ourselves. I just I just think it would be good to to know that we looked and went through that exercise. Yeah, um, absolutely, and just to frame it for the public's understanding. Um, there is a, a tremendous amount of analysis that needs to be done. And so the, the two big factors that you would look at are what is the internal cost of providing the services that we need for doing O&M and PM? So whether it's or CM versus PM, right? So best case scenario is you're doing about 80% is preventative maintenance where you're changing oil and tires and about 20% of what you're doing is Corrective maintenance, fixing stuff that's broken. Well, given the age of our fleet, so instead of having a fleet that's turned over once every three years where you would have very little cost other than some PM, mostly PM, a little bit of CM, our fleet is 10, 15, some vehicles 20 years old. And so what we're seeing is the reality is we're probably doing about 70% corrective maintenance and about 30% of preventative maintenance. Right, so that model that you have is one that is much more labor labor intensive. So um, I can tell you that as a general rule, based on the analysis that we've done, our costs are lower than contracting with a third party who not only is compensating their employees, paying for their overhead, but they're also turning a profit. So we will provide you with the analysis to, to show that our justification is that our costs are lower than contracting with the third party. The other part of it, of course, is the major overarching policy question, which is at what level would the governing body need to fund a complete replacement of our fleet mm -hmm. to get it from 15, average of 15 years to an average of three years to be able to, to roll it over. And that we can put together some numbers in terms of what that is, but um, I, We'll want to make sure you're sitting down when you when you review that because it's going to be an initial staggering sum plus a annual contribution to be able to revolve and turn that fleet every three years, whether it's through lease purchase, lease, or purchase. Okay, but that kind of that summarizes the issues that you're raising. Sure, right? sure. I was under understanding though that like a lot of times, like police cars only have a hundred thousand miles on them before we get rid of them. Is that not? Correct. I mean, when you say 15 years, are you talking about, I know our dump trucks are heavy equipment stuff, but that's not what we're talking Correct. about here. I'm, I'm looking at, at the whole fleet, and, and certainly we have cases where, you know, we're challenged now because of the supply and demand in terms of the, of the police cruisers. Right. But, you know, we can provide an estimate in terms of what that life is, but when you look at the entire city, when you look at public works, 
we have some 15 and 20 year old vehicles that are still being still being used and, and across the utilities as well. Sure, sure. I, I guess just the last thing I'll say too is that I know like my company's looking at an at a electric semi now. There's no oil changes. Uh, the brakes last a long time because it's regenerated braking when you stop. Um, you know, you don't have a transmission anymore. I mean, it just really, um, the initial purchase price is higher, but maintenance goes to virtually zero except for battery replacements in 10 years. But I think it's another thing we need to be cognizant of because I, th I think the city fleet is a great case for electrification, right? I mean, people are coming, they're getting the vehicle at 7.30 in the morning. They're probably driving less than 100 miles in most cases. They're bringing it back. Um, you know, it doesn't idle, you know, especially get rid of the gas, the cost of gasoline. Um, I mean, w we may find that we could we can electrify our fleet, our, you know, our light duty stuff, and actually save money on a year-to-year -year basis. I, I don't know that, but that'd be my guess. We can, certainly, we can certainly take a look at that as well. And you're right, the technology keeps, him, keeps improving, <laughs> and the electrical vehicles today bear no resemblance to electrical vehicles 10 years ago. Yeah. Um, any other questions from the committee? Go, go ahead, Deputy Mayor. What, what's the action? Is this just an informational discussion at this point? or This is purely just a discussion to try to gauge your interest and to get any comments, feedback that you have for us. Obviously, you've uh, clearly asked us for some additional information relative to um, the fleet ownership in terms of where we are in terms of what our costs are in terms of internal versus contracting with third parties, we'll provide you that information. Maybe a question for Jason. Didn't didn't we do the whole lease purchase analysis a year ago, two years ago, something like that? And so that analysis was started about three years ago at this point. We ran through a, a variety of different options. Uh, at the time that we were ready for implementation, the market had moved significantly enough that that was no longer a viable option. Um, so that was something that we are not currently pursuing, but that was something that was heavily considered. Um, yeah. But obviously with changes in interest rates and vehicle availability, a lot of factors changed over the course of that investigation. Okay, thank you. The only other thing, do we think we've exhausted uh, every possibility when it comes to, I, I'm totally against leasing any space. I think that's just, we're just buying trouble down the road someplace. And I mean, we're sitting in a building that, that uh, represents the you know the city's thinking 20 years ago moving from lease space for public works and planning and everybody else to a building we own and i think it's it makes a lot of sense so i'm not going to support leasing any facility do we think we've exhausted the opportunity to buy a facility that's big enough that could be retrofitted and perhaps meet the meet the timeline i know you said it's about the same i I don't know about that, uh, but just just a question. Correct, and thank you. And obviously, that was our first impulse was to acquire a fleet building that would not have to have major major renovation. Uh, the one that we looked at potentially was Sears, which is the old Sears Automotive. What we understand from the owners of that property is that it has multiple problems and needs to be demolished. They're the ones that offered to allow us to redevelop a part of a large building that they own on the, on the boulevard to use that for as a leased facility paying, of course, taxes and insurance. Um, we looked at 1900 Topeka Boulevard. Uh, that is currently owned by a third party. We have had our uh, real estate broker made repeated requests that we would be able to look at that. It's the old Reichert uh, building on the, on the west side. Thank you. Uh, a couple of problems with that is we understand that uh, in the Shunga flood that there was some damage to that that was not remediated, so we understand there's some environmental issues. Also, part of that property is in the flood plain, but part of that property is in the flood way. As, as you know, you not, cannot be permitted to reconstruct in the flood way. Flood plain does allow for reconstruction if you can elevate a foot above the BFE and you are able to do a study and get KDA to approve that you're gonna have compensatory cut to offset that so you have no rise. So those are the ones, we also took a look at the Winkley um, garage that is currently owned by Washburn Foundation. Uh, problem with that, again, 
floodplain, and that was only 10 bays. So we, we tried to look at the ones that were, that were there. Unfortunately, every time we're, we're faced with challenges. And then, of course, the KDOT facility with environmental and number of other issues would not be my first choice. Thank you. Yeah, any other questions? I don't have a question, but my preference is if we've got city land, I would prefer to build on it and get what we need. How many bays do we need? So we currently have 16, so that would, of course, be where I would like to, would like to land. You know, as we go through and refine, we can take a, a hard look at that to see if we can function with less. Okay, then the other thing would be the ability to um, adapt the facility in case, say, the heavy duty down on North Topeka Boulevard goes out, that there is room to either add on or adapt some of the bays to cover that too. Yes, absolutely, and we recognize that. In the, you know, there have been a couple of different things that have been pointed out on the heavy duty shop, and one is. Um, that particular tract of land at 201 North Topeka potentially becomes ripe for redevelopment in terms of the redevelopment of the riverfront. Uh, the other part is that the, there are some structural issues that we currently have with the existing heavy-duty garage. So we know that that facility is not going to, to last forever without having significant capital investment in terms of structural repairs that are necessary. So it's a question of good money after bad or do you cut your losses at some point and move the facility? But our, our preference would be to have single point for all of the all of the garages. All right. Uh, I guess you'll get us that information. Yes, sir. Tom, please, sir. Thank you. Our uh, next item is probably what everyone's here for the presentation on parking. Yep, thank you, and I will uh, present, and um, Jason will uh, chip in as necessary, and we have our design build team who is uh, starting to do the rehabilitation work on our garages here, if there are any specific questions. And she casually hands this to me, assuming that I actually know how to, to work it. <laughs> so, uh, it has been a while since we have walked down this road. It was last October, so it was nearly a year ago when the governing body passed the parking ordinance. So just want to take a second and reset everyone. Um, it, over a three-year process, we had many, many conversations with the governing body in terms of all aspects of parking, whether that was privatize, maintain it as public, enter into a, a contract with a third party to operate. Do we look at park, parking rates? Do we look at continuing non, no parking on the avenue? So all of these different issues were looked at. City staff made a final recommendation, and that was to maintain the ownership and management of all of our parking access. It was to convert Kansas Avenue in the 100 blocks to paid parking. It was to increase. It was to increase the parking rates for the first time since 2010 to be able to fund the operations as well as to fund ongoing maintenance activities knowing that we had a $22 million deficit in terms of deferred maintenance on all of our parking facilities. And so that was basically the model that was put together. So that was the recommendation that was contained in the ordinance. This allowed for minimum and maximum funding, I'm sorry, minimum maximum rates. And you'll see that this is what the fee structure was that was in the approved parking ordinance. So lots establishing minimum maximum parking garages on street, moving to paid parking on Kansas Avenue, as well as the 100 blocks on either side of Kansas Avenue to remove the hoods and get those back to, back to paid parking. Uh, additionally, it was increases in the um, hoods and the and the fines. So we 
uh, I mentioned the $22 million of deferred maintenance, which includes a significant amount for the uptowner that the city has now taken back over. Um, design build team has gone through, has done their initial assessment. We have, I have a slate I'll share with you later in terms of our estimates, in terms of the cost, and that we went ahead and uh, got started on the um, town site. Uptowner starts next week. Uh, to be able to get some get some improvements, and then we went ahead and did increase the hood prices and the citation costs, uh, and that became effective on January first of twenty twenty three. Uh, the remaining uh, changes were not implemented. Um, uh, at staff staff was directed to not implement those. So, where we stand right now, um, one of the thing I want to point out is December of 2022, uh, we were informed by two of our largest tenants. They uh, were not needing spaces in our garages. That amounts to about $21,000 of revenue hit that we have taken on those two uh, tenants, which one was Townsite Plaza and the other is Evergy in terms of, of the vacancies that they have and the uh, a policy decision by Evergy to relocate uh, from Topeka to their Kansas City office. So uh, you can see basically where we are in terms of our projections based on uh, where we currently are for revenue. Uh, last year we hit about 2.5 million. Uh, this year we're projecting about 2.3. Big delta in that is of course the loss of the parking being in our garages. And then you can see where we are right now in terms of Year to date, and this is as of July 31st. Last year at this time, we were at $1.4 million, and right now we're 1.37, so uh, basically $10,000 uh, less in terms of, uh, almost $100,000 less in terms of where we were last year. Uh, here is the, our current estimates in terms of the costs of the rehabilitation of our various garages from town site to parking shop. Um, obviously, starting point, of course, is structural, waterproofing, and then mechanical, electrical, plumbing, fire protection, and life safety. Uh, and this is the $22 million CIP item that was approved last October in tandem with the parking ordinance, allowing for the rate increases. So the... <coughs> Our, our current plan, our recommendation is to implement a 10% increase in the rates that we charge on our garages. Um, as we get the garages back online and we complete the repairs, thereafter we would go with an annual increase of approximately 3%, which would equate to once every three years making a 10% uh, increase in the, in the rates. Um, then uh, we would also Im implement at this time paid parking on Kansas Avenue, as well as to implement paid park on the 100 paid parking on the 100 blocks of Kansas Avenue. We would estimate that the revenue to be generated from Kansas Avenue would be $250,000 a year, and we estimate $100,000 a year for the 100 blocks on the east and west side of the avenues. It would take us three months to place the order for the pay stations as well as to do the public campaign, put notice out there that uh, we're going to start charging. Uh, we would do this through a limited number of pay stations, and then we would do it through the, our application base. Uh, my long-term vision is to eventually remove all parking meters and to move purely to application-based as well as supplemented by the pay stations. Parking meters are mechanical. It's a question of when are they going to fail, not whether they're going to fail. They are uh, an attractive target for theft, vandalism, as well as um, our meters are getting old. It's tough to keep them, keep them operating, and it's time-consuming, staff, labor-consuming to go out and empty those meters and basically count the coin. So that's uh, where we are in terms of our contemplated... Uh, pay station, uh, because I do recognize that not everyone has a smartphone. 
Uh, and so we do need to make sure that we're accommodating those people that, that don't have that ability to pull up an app on their phone and make the, and make the payment. So uh, additionally, we're looking at increasing some of that 10 hour parking. One of the things that we've identified in terms of looking at our downtown parking area is that we recognize that there are employees, particularly in restaurants, some of the retail establishments that are being paid minimum wage. Paying a dollar an hour, a dollar 25 an hour doesn't work for them. And so we're looking at increasing some of that 10 hour parking where we have. We also recognize that the one hour time limits are not effective in terms of our enforcement staff having to go out every hour and have to, having to cite that person again, right? So we're looking at are there opportunities to eliminate those one hour spot, spots, go to two hours, as well as to shift some two hours to four hours, again, making it more efficient for us in terms of, of the enforcement. And then, again, as I mentioned, uh, our goal is to ultimately move to an app-based as opposed to a meter-based system for the on-street on -street parking. And then uh, basically our financial projections in terms of proposed uh, rates as well as our projections out 26, 29, and 32. And then pro uh, projected revenue you see in uh, 10, 10 years out, healthy balance 7.5 again these rates are designed to allow for ongoing maintenance to be self-funded out of the out of the operations as opposed to having to look to the governing body for capital funding assistance in terms of, of maintaining those I mean bottom line is we believe it is a business and should be run by a, by a business that you have to recognize you have to have enough revenue to offset your expenses not just to operate but also for that ongoing maintenance because parking garages have to be maintained as is evidenced by the fact that we have $22 million of deferred maintenance on the city's parking garages. And so with that, I will gladly stand for any questions that the governing body or that should. Okay, questions for Copley? I, I did see that uh, Councilwoman Hiller is on here and I didn't know if she had any questions? I know a lot of it. Well, all this is her area, her district. Councilwoman, go ahead. I don't really. I just wanted to sit in on it. I've been in touch with people, as you can imagine, throughout this time. So um, just want to make sure it goes smoothly. I'm happy to answer questions, but um, I appreciate the work that staff has put into this. And there is this some word out on the street and Ashley has, has alerted the people in, in DTI that have been vocal about this issue before. So uh, people had um, simply thought the issue was fully decided back in November, as you all recall, so. Okay, thank you, thank you, Councilwoman. Uh, Deputy Mayor, go ahead. As a general overview, our current occupancy is about 75% um, in all garages total. That's obviously going to vary by location uh, and what the businesses are surrounding those garages. Uh, we do currently have quite a bit of space at the townside garage, but there are renovations ongoing, so we have not made a major effort to get more people to occupy that garage because we only have one level open as of right now. Sorry about that. I'll turn my mic on. We, we've got eight garages. I think the question, particularly as we see um, occup occupancy go down from some of our major employers, is do we need eight garages? Is there an opportunity, not right now, but at some point to essentially shut down a garage someplace and absorb those folks in, in other garages? Um, any thoughts, any any. Has any thought been given to that? Yes, yes, sir. A great deal of thought and a lot of conversation. And that is one of the 
underlying principles of this governing body in terms of its strategic plan as growth as one of those. And so I'm really remiss to close a garage because then it becomes either do I demolish that garage or do I go ahead and continue the cost of mothballing that garage in terms of the ongoing maintenance and not generating any revenue from that. And then what happens when that next developer comes in and says, I've identified this particular block to do a multifamily mixed use project and I need to have a garage there. Now all of a sudden I'm looking at $30 million investment for, for a garage. So it's very much the chicken and the egg in terms of do I look at just laser focus on today in terms of what I need and could I possibly close and demolish a garage? Or do I want to keep my options open in terms of potential, potential growth? And these absolutely are policy decisions and the clear guidance that I've heard from the governing body resounding is we need to grow and we need to have that potential to be able to grow. It, and I agree. I think the question is what does growth look like? I mean, you obviously, Things have changed in the last three years. Every business everywhere is faced with the same thing. We've got employees not coming to work every day, that not coming to the office every day, working from home, working remotely. Uh, I don't know if the state of Kansas is back in force yet. Yeah. I don't know how many of our larger downtown employers are. And I understand Evergy is a different issue. They're probably moving a lot of their folks out. Um, but I think, it, and again, I'm not, advocating closing a garage right now, but I think that's got to be part of the discu ongoing discussion as we figure out what post-COVID employment looks like. Um, yeah, if we get downtown living and those garages can be utilized for that, that's fantastic. But that's also going to mean a shift in the dynamic because then you've got to provide parking for those folks, which means daily parking for office workers has to be somewhere else. So. Um, appreciate the fact that thoughts gone into that thanks just for some context prior to last December we had seen a, a reduction in occupancy throughout the COVID period um, we were steadily climbing until that period last December uh, which we were at about 92 percent occupancy uh, and then obviously uh, the loss of a couple major tenants that have not been refilled yet is has what's caused us to be where we're at today uh, Mr. Copley, I, I take it have you already, I, I take it you guys all the way through this have been meeting and discussing this with the downtown stakeholders? There, there have been discussions with downtown stakeholders, which is what led the uh, direction to staff to not increase <coughs> rates, to not charge on Kansas Avenue, to not increase rates in the garages. So the we're here in front of you today to basically say, there's an issue. We have an ordinance that was passed by the governing body last October. And it, the direction from the governing body to implement the ordinance that it was passed, or is it to queue it up and to put it back in front of you to repeal that, right? That's, that's where we are. I mean, I don't feel sure. comfortable as the public works director basically saying we're going to move forward with this. I think that this is a Passing an ordinance is a policy matter by the governing body, and staff should be directed to implement that ordinance or to queue it up and bring it back to rescind that ordinance. Sure. Um, I, I do see, uh, at least uh, Mr. Highland. I, I hope I'm saying that right, your last name, but did you want to comment on this or just here to kind of see the the uh, sausage being made. Sure, please. Yeah, please. Uh, Mr. Highland here is with AIM Strategies. Yeah, good morning, everybody. Um, you know, to speak on behalf of our group, I think what our major concern is is just with the state of retail downtown, um, you know, we've there's been businesses like Leaping Llamas. I've seen Jersey Mike's is just closing up uh, here, and it just seems like anything we're doing to, you know, further make it more in, – in, introduce more challenges for people to come downtown, spend money, drive business, you know, parking's an inhibitor of that. And we're just really afraid that, you know, adding that parking fee back on Kansas Avenue is just gonna be a huge detriment to all the progress we've made. 
Um, and so we're hoping, you know, developments like the taco at, you know, 8th and Kansas can keep pushing the momentum forward, but it just seems like outside of our group that everybody's really struggling. And, um, you know, and when I see numbers like the, you know, amount of businesses having their employees parking decline, and then we're suggesting that rates go up, it kind of seems like a, a backwards equation that, you know, demand is going down, yet we're raising prices. Um, so I think it just, it's, it still seems like it's just not the right time because downtown still has a long ways to come. And, you know, we're, we're going to be keep, we're going to keep working towards that goal, but it's just hard when we see everybody else really struggling um, to say that now's the time that that makes sense. Sure, go ahead. Th thank you. Go ahead, yeah. Deputy Mayor. Just, just a question for you, uh, coming with your outside perspective. So we can't fund the parking fund as a business, and you know everybody loves to say let's run, let's run government like a business, which mm -hmm. is impossible, but it sounds good. So any suggestions on how we continue to fund downtown parking? We've looked at privatizing the garages. Uh, funny thing is nobody wants to take on the garages because they're money losers. So now it's it's city government, which means the taxpayers taking that on. Any any thoughts on how we rectify that situation? You know, I wish I had a, an, an awesome answer for that, but um, I, I just almost think we have to look at it as a longer term, you know, play here is that, you know, if we can drive more activity to downtown and you know increase the revenues that these garages can even pull and increase the occupancy um that you know it, you get that revenue source back that this equation hopefully comes closer to balancing i, I just know that isn't the short-term solution um but do we want to make a short-term decision that you know is a detriment to everybody's long-term goals here i mean I, yeah, I, I don't have an answer for how you're, you're solving this budget for, um, the, you know, next year or anything, but uh, it just seems like it, it needs to be something we, we consider an investment in the future. Thank you. Is there anyone else in the audience? That, thank you, Mr. Yep. Highland. Um, anyone else in the audience that wanted to comment on this? Uh, so I guess, uh, Mr. Copley... You don't necessarily need action from this committee. This is really something, I guess, um, or Mr. Nines? Oh, I was no, going to no. say, feel free yeah, to weigh in. Uh, we'll no, I just, um, you're needing direction, but technically you, the direction you would take would come from the city manager on this because you already have the direction from our resolution. But uh, I guess I'm not certain what you need from us right now on this. So you have an ordinance, you pass an ordinance a year ago, and that ordinance directs staff to implement those rates. You had a transition, that didn't happen. I got here, I want to understand this after a few months. But you still have an ordinance on the book that directs staff to do this, all right? So I think you have to address that first. You have to, and, and the city attorney can tell you if you want to make any changes in 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 the ordinance. But you have increasing cost, and the only way you can, re, well, not the only way, but the primary way you capture those increasing costs is through the parking rates you said. And I have great empathy for what the gentleman just said. I think there's some different models to look at that help with that. If you don't capture it through the um, parking rates, then the only other place, well, there's only a couple other options. The only other place you go to is um, general, reven general revenues of the city. You finance through general GO bonds and you pay that through the tax levy. And we certainly don't want to increase where a property tax is already for that. Um, the other option is if if you have to do um, targeted maintenance, you may have to close some garages down. Might be temporary, might be for a little while longer in order to get this done. Remember that figure, $22 million worth of deferred maintenance. 
So if I can just piggyback and add a couple of comments. The, this ordinance provides some discretion, right? So we have the ability to go ahead and implement based this proposed plan. If we're seeing a adverse impact on businesses, if we're seeing that people are not willing to pay to park on Kansas Avenue, we have the ability to lower that rate down to the minimum that was established under the ordinance. As I had indicated as part of the plan that we've staff has put together, looking at opportunities to increase that 10 hour parking. That 10 hour parking is basically extremely reasonable in terms of the cost. In increasing the four hour parking. So it's an issue of supply and demand. So if someone wants to park on Kansas Avenue and they're willing to pay the dollar and a quarter, or dollar fifty an hour to do so, fine. If they don't want to do that, they can park on those sidewalks and those are dollar twenty five, I believe, as opposed to dollar fifty an hour. Or they can go another block and basically perhaps be in a four hour zone where they're spending even less. I mean, so there are some options in terms of people not willing to pay that and still pay a lower amount, but still be very proximate to that central business district to be able to workshop play in that, in that downtown area. And so, and I would also tell you this, um, um, Braxton has thought through this and thought through this and thought through this. And I think there's some, there's some flexible ways to implement this and get to the same place. But what you, I guess you could not take any action, but if you take no action, you know what the future looks like. That deficit grows bigger and you have less revenues to make um, repairs on those parking garages. They're owned by the city. They're part of the infrastructure of the city. Um, they are there to help get people downtown, the work, and play downtown, and to shop downtown, and to eat. So it's important that we keep those in safe condition. The council member Hiller has a question. Uh, uh, Councilwoman, please go ahead. Thank you. Um, let me pitch in just a couple more minutes, I guess. Uh, I want to compliment the staff for the work that they've done. When uh, I've been sitting through these discussions since before we did Kansas Avenue, right? So I've seen both the big businesses and the small businesses um, wrestle with it, watch the city wrestle with it as well. Um, I would suggest that what, you know, for one thing, the downtown merchants that are there are just expecting it and why the city wondering why we didn't do it. Um, in terms of, of where we are, one could certainly argue, for one thing, we have a collection of garages that are the envy of any town. What you want, the, what the advisors told us way back was a block and a half is the most, is, is the ideal for people to walk, whether it's to work or to shop or whatever. We have the garages, we have them located, we're in great position with that, and we did make the commitment to fix them up. In terms of the parking on the avenue, yes, we've lost a couple businesses for their own reasons recently, but thanks to AIM Strategies and others, we're really, we've come so far. I don't know if the number is 50%, but let's just use that. Um, there's a threshold at which we, um, in a way, when you walk down the downtown, you see that it's kind of raggedy, you know, and we, we've got those bags on the meters and so on. In terms of going to this next level to develop the downtown, getting the parking done. Um, if you have to pay at all, the rates are comparably very low. The staff has done a really good job, my opinion, of budgeting in that what we need is a decision and we need to act like the council voted on in November. And the way they've structured the rates and the chart that Braxton just shared with you, um, once they once they roll those current incre the increases in the garages into place when the garages are done not before but when they're done and then roll the um the rates on the avenue and the side streets into place when when they pop those meters in and they think or the pay boxes in and they think they can do it in three months um then we'll be finished we'll be ready to go and those 
the complaints, if we've gotten any, really were, well, we, these businesses don't know, or, you know, or people that are marketing lease space or sold space can't tell them for sure what the deal will be. And I would suggest that as we, as the council felt last November, that we're at a point where we need to just finish the job, get those bags off, get the system in place so everybody knows this is the deal and let's let's take that next round of growing. And again, hats off to AIM Strategies for all that they've done. We need to make sure we get everybody else moving. Um, just, just to put some framework and some thanks to the staff. I think Jason told me he'd done like 40 different iterations of how the money could work. and and um, not having the rates change for three years after they're in, setting this system up now and getting going so we're not bankrupting the fund, but also not being being sure, relatively sure, of course, that uh, the rates would not change for three years in any of those spots on, and then go on a rotation, I think will be of great comfort to everyone involved. Thanks. Thank you, Councilwoman. Uh, Deputy Mayor, go ahead. Thank you, Chair. Um, what... What does it cost us to enforce on-street parking and maintain on-street parking on an annual basis? Um, so I don't have that exact number today. I can certainly get that information for you. Uh, I can tell you the enforcement of on-street parking. We have three parking enforcement officers in their vehicle to patrol. Um, we generally get less than 10% of our revenue. In fact, over the past five years, it's been less than 7% of our revenue is from actual citations. So we do have a system that's funded by people who know what they're paying for rather than being punished for making a mistake. Uh, it, it looks like our revenue from on-street parking is roughly 250, 275,000 a year. Is that correct? Our projected revenue by going to paid parking on Kansas Avenue as well as the 100 blocks would be that uh, approximately 350,000. Okay. And we're probably spending, I mean, if you had to guess, funding three people and whatnot, we're probably spending 200, 250,000. We can. Um, why don't we just do away with enforcement of on street parking? The challenge of that would be I am not sure how many people would be willing to pay us for parking if there was no enforcement mechanism. I mean, if not, they didn't pay. not paying for parking, just free parking everywhere. I have a question of how many people would reserve a garage space under that scenario. Yeah, the, the employees of businesses would just go there in the morning and sit there and then leave at the end of the day. Correct. If we had no mechanism to make sure that our retailers and our restaurant businesses had a space available, right. I think that would be long-term detrimental to their business. But that is certainly a consideration and has been tried elsewhere. I mean, it is an answer to the question of you're killing my business because I have to pay for my customers have to pay for parking. We could theoretically have free parking everywhere downtown. Yep, absolutely. I'm afraid that the law of unintended consequences that those businesses would be blowing us up because all of the state employees are taking all of those stalls on Kansas Avenue and now there's no place for my customers to be able to park. But it is an option. Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, Uh, sure, go ahead. If we go to all pay parking, what happens to those spots where the restaurants have 15 minute parking to pick up food? So the 15 minute parking stalls would stay in place. So you'd still have that ability for that free 15 minute parking, right? But it would be the other stalls that currently are free parking that don't have any temporal limitations on them. That's what we're talking about. Okay. Yeah, and I, I guess um, I appreciated the deputy mayor's question because it does get you thinking that, you know, this isn't necessarily just a revenue thing. It's also a way to make sure parking's turned over and that um, customers park there instead of people who happen to work downtown. Um, I guess, you know, in, in, in uh, hearing Councilwoman uh, Hiller, I mean, she has lived and breathed this for probably, I don't know, 15 years or maybe more, and, and she's she's forgotten more than I'll ever know about downtown parking. So, uh, and, I, and I know she regularly meets with a lot of people uh, in her district and especially downtown. So I guess my thought is if 
you know, if, if she is okay with this, then I, I certainly am as well. Um, and, and I guess I'm, I take a little bit of um, solace in the fact that under a new app-based system, we could also change the rates pretty quickly. Um, if it starts impacting businesses, we could always, you know, there's ways we, I guess we can quickly iterate uh, what we're doing. Is that? Yep, absolutely. And obviously my preference would be administratively, we turn on a dime as necessary within the firm guidelines that you've established in terms of the minimum and maximum. But obviously if that, if that doesn't work, then we clearly, the governing body has the ability to come back in and tweak the ordinance to make any, any changes. So my, my recommendation would be <coughs> governing bodies passed it, give us an opportunity to implement it within the guidelines of the ordinance. And then if we need to uh, administratively adjust things on the fly, we can do that. If it needs to go back in front of the governing body, there's always that possibility. Sure, go ahead, Deputy Mayor. Thanks. Um, so we're talking about, you're talking about shifting from one hour to two hour parking is the minimum, right? So Kansas Avenue would be two hour parking, side streets would be two hour parking. What about the option of the first hour is free, but if you park over that, you're paying, so there paying are for parking. Have we looked at that? So in an on-street scenario, that's a little bit t more difficult to enforce um, because it does require us to accurately know how long everyone has been at every location, uh, which is a challenge. Uh, within a garage scenario, that is something that we've considered, that as a consideration, rather than charging a dollar an hour, the first hour to two hours could be free, and then subsequent hours two through ten could be adjusted so that the revenue would be neutral. Um, but you would have a period of time where it would be free, and that would encourage more people to be off the street, which is less congestion, uh, safer. So those are all things that we've considered. I think that maybe that's something to run by DTI and some of the folks that, that have interfaced with us in the past on downtown parking. If there was an option where I understand somebody that's coming down for a quick lunch, wants to run into a store, uh, you know, if, if there's something they could do to make that, that uh, operation free, uh, but the long-term parking pays. Maybe, maybe that tends to approach a compromise with uh, with the folks that just you know can't can't see a way that we can charge for parking on Kansas Avenue and the hundred blocks. Thanks. I I would just offer you this. I'm just happy to find a parking place down there at lunch. But that's all right. I I would offer you this that. Every community has this same discussion when it comes to parking, especially in the downtown um, area. I've been in communities where there's been parking meters. I've been in communities where there's been no parking meters. Um, it really all comes down to what the governing body wants, um, what what kind of enforcement they want, and uh, you're still going to hear about it. So. I think you have to kind of focus on what's the goal of parking in the downtown. Are we trying to move parking so we get the greatest amount of patrons downtown to use the retail and use the restaurants? Um, are, are, we, are we just trying to provide a place for people, whether they're employees or not, parking down there? And if, if you talk about those goals, it may make the daylight a little bit brighter on where we ought to be. But I think your rates are appropriate. I think if we're going, and, and, I, and, and to give Braxton credit, I've kind of procrastinated on this since I've been here. And I'm the one that said, let's take it back to the committee because I want to hear where they're really at and where they want to really go in this. And if we're going to go enforce this, then we'll go enforce that. But I just, I brought it back to you, the review, and make sure we were all on the same track together. Uh, well, so as a clear as mud, uh, Director Cobbley, what we want you to do? Absolutely. I will take direction from the city manager. We will move sure. forward from there. That that sounds great. Thank you. I, okay. I do appreciate it. I know this has been a contentious so, 
Mr. Mr. Chair, do you have any direction for me so I can give direction to Braxton? Well, I'll let you know in four months. <laughs> no Mondays. <laughs> yes, no Mondays. Neither of us will be here, so we'll. Um, okay. Well, thank you. I, I guess we've kind of exhausted that topic right now. Uh, the next item is Polk Quincy Viaduct Utility Updates. And I'm guessing that's Ms. Davis. Good morning. I will provide a quick brief update for you guys. Um, we're a little bit behind schedule based on some of the redesign work that had to happen. Um, we're still working on some of that, but as, as an overview, you all know we took the one large project and broke that into six smaller projects. Um, at this point, we are getting all the contracts signed for project two, which is the first of the smaller projects that we let out. Um, that is a water line project to the west side of the scope of work. Um, we are hoping once we, once we finish that up, there's about 60 days open for start of construction there, but um, we're gonna finalize some of those details here very soon so we can give you better updates on what's happening with that. Uh, we are currently, uh, I should add that we um, came in almost 40% under budget with that first project, under the, un, under the engineer's estimate for that first project. So that was positive news. Um, the second project was actually project seven that was let. Um, that one came in over engineer estimate and we are still negotiating some costs there to see if we can get some savings before we award that project. We are hoping to do that within the next week or so, hopefully nail some things down so we can move forward. Project number six let last Friday and should close on October 18th. So we're looking forward to seeing what those bids come back in. Once we get that one um, and, and hopefully number five back as well, we'll have a better idea of maybe what the totality of this looks like compared to our engineering estimates. Um, project five we hope to let by October 13th. So you can see we're, we're finally starting to get on a roll here, um, then we will be left with projects three and four. Uh, some of that needed, again, some continued design with the relocation of, of one of our CSO locations, our combined sewer overflow locations. Um, that realignment, we did get approval from KDHE, so we're happy to finally have that box checked and we're going to go ahead and finalize that design. And then um, project four final design was dependent on whether or not that was going to get approved in three. So we're getting some momentum going for sure. Um, we hope to have an open house uh, scheduled for late November at the latest once we get more details in terms of when construction is gonna start and who that's going to impact as we firm up some of these contracts. How's that for a quick update? That's great. Uh, any questions <laughs> for Mrs. Davis? <laughs> <laughs> Cliff, notes? Cliff notes, yes. All right. Well, it looks like uh, no questions. Thank you for that, okay. Ms. Davis. Sure. Um, any other items? Anything else anyone wants to discuss, needs to discuss? All right. Seeing none, we are out of here. Thanks, guys. <laughs>